um, a fundamental paper in, uh, in ecology and genetics is, was published by uh, Sokol in 78. And I had the pleasure to meet him uh, short before he died in Stony Brook. And he's a very, very special person. And one of the greatest scientists in the second half of the 20th century. Would you agree with that, Town? Without a doubt. Huh? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. So this, this is a great, great, great researcher. Uh, and he has influenced uh, genetics, ecology, general biology in several different ways. And one of his best papers, in my opinion, in the, is this 78 paper uh, in which uh, Robert Sokol set uh, the scene for studying spatial autocorrelation in biology. And today what we will study is mostly um, uh, is, is how he describes the importance of spatial autocorrelation for us. Um, he wasn't doing ecology exactly, but uh, the methodology is exactly the same. We're actually going to go through a worked example that is in this paper. So if you want to go back and, and, and restudy what we're going to talk. Now, what time? Is there a break? What time is the break? 11 o'clock. 11, OK. Uh, if by any chance you want to uh, redo all the, uh, ex the work that sample we're going to have today, uh, you can go back to this paper and, and read it. It's pretty, pretty good to read, pretty easy to read, and very, very interesting. And what did Sokol did? Uh, he actually imported a a statistical methodology from these two guys, uh, Cliff and Ord, and these guys were statisticians, but they were working in geography. And what Sokol did was to go there, study their methods, uh, apply these methods to, ecol uh, to biology, and explain how it could be useful to biologists to look closely at the spatial structure in the, in the data. So what we're going to do now is to look at the spatial structure in the data, measure it, describe it, and interpret it, right? Uh, our focus here is going to be uh, biodiversity, species richness, but it could be any other pattern, any other uh, information that is, that is mapped on the surface. Interestingly, uh, in 78, uh, Soko and Odin published this paper, and it still took another 10 or 50 years uh, to ecologists to really start applying this. I don't know if this guy was just ahead of his time, he probably was for almost everything he was doing. He was like 10 years ahead of everyone else. Um, but also, at this point in science, uh, computers were not readily available to everybody. So what we're going to do here is a simplified example. You can do that like with a piece of paper and a pen, or maybe even better with Excel. Um, but at this time, it was really complicated to do analysis on larger uh, data sets. So um, a, more than a decade after that comes Pierre Legendre and uh, Marie-José Fortin. The, these are two Canadians. I also had the, the pleasure to meet them. Um, 
And Pierre Legendre and uh, Marie-José Fortin have been uh, moving forward with the applications of spatial statistics or the analysis of spatial structures, uh, particularly to ecological data sets or to ecology. So now we are talking about biodiversity patterns and how it can be used to study the causal processes, the mechanisms behind it. Uh, and here we can mention two papers or, or two books. Well, that's, a, that's the famous numerical ecology book. It's really, really good, easy to follow. It's kind of a Bible for, for ecologists, for numerical ecologists. And recently, um, Jose Marie Fortin has published this other book, Spatial Analysis. It's also pretty good and easy to follow. So if you want to go deeper in, in, in the analysis of spatial patterns, this is a highly recommended book. Um, so this particular paper, uh, very influential, has been read and cited probably more than a thousand times in the literature. It's really important. Uh, it was published by uh, Pierre Legendre in uh, 1993. And in, in this paper, Legendre has said something really important. So you have a data set, look at the data, and you look at the data set. For example, it's a species richness in Africa, richness of some group. Is that a trouble to analyze that data set from the statistical perspective? Or is it like something really interesting from the ecological perspective? A new paradigm. Uh, this word paradigm here means a new way of thinking in ecology. Um, so what he has actually uh, advocated uh, since that paper is that the presence of spatial autocorrelation, which means the fact that your map or your ecological map, your biological map, for example, species regions, has a spatial autocorrelation, means a lot. It means a lot from the ecological side because you have the unique opportunity to look at the spatial map, the, the spatial pattern, and come up with potential explanations for it. You are now talking about the, the underlying causes of this. And the, that particular st spatial structure is very, very important to uh, provide insights on what are these causes. However, at that point in 1993, Analyzing spatial autocorrelation, or more than that, analyzing spatially autocorrelated data was still a problem. It is not a problem for us anymore, uh, or it's not, no longer a trouble or trouble. We can work it out. We're going to do this today. Uh, how to analyze the data, understand what it means, how we can uh, describe it, measure it. It's pretty important to be on top of that uh, methodology so that we can use that information. We can use the spatial information, capture it, measure it, interpret it. So it's pretty important we, we are familiar with that methodology. Well, uh, these are the numbers of papers in each field, each line here is a field in science. And these are the number of papers that use spatial autocorrelation in the literature. And this outlier here, this outline here, is ecology. So after the 1993 paper published by Legendre, uh, the way ecologists use spatial autocorrelation or uh, analyze data, uh, spatial structure in, in ecological data sets,
has completely changed. So it is now uh, particular to the field of ecology of biodiversity to study spatial autocorrelation. And it has been increasing this way for since then. So I still need to update this slide too. Um, so it's now common for ecologists to look at patterns and uh, study this pattern from the statistical perspective and use these statistical tools to uh, interpret this data and make better decisions on how to manage biodiversity uh, that we are concerned about. So from the, from the analysis side, uh, the analysis of spatial data, we go into two different directions. In, for each direction, there will be a group of statistical methods or a group of a, a whole methodology that is different, but also they interact. First, there is what we're going to explore today called exploratory data analysis. And uh, because our, uh, our day is limited, our time is limited, we're going to do a, uh, a, an exercise on exploratory data analysis. But if we had to do modeling, statistical modeling and inference, we're gonna, we will be using uh, different um, statistical methods that are also very important to, in research. Uh, and it will be even more um, useful to understand causes of biodiversity. But then we would need another day or two for that. So today we're gonna explore uh, the data from the statistical side and I'll be commenting on modeling and inference, but we're not going to go much deeper than in, in the statistical side. And usually, these two uh, perspectives, they, they go hand in hand. Uh, you analyze data uh, from the modeling perspective, and then you describe whatever results your model have, and that feeds back to the modeling perspective so that we update the way we understand nature. So these are uh, two very related and interactive uh, process in spatial analysis. And for exploratory data analysis, I mean it aims to understand spatial patterns in data, use these patterns or combine them to infer ecological evolutionary processes underlying these structures. And for modeling and inference, I mean spatial structure generate pseudo-replication pseudo and that causes some problems to the analysis. And so we need to uh, adapt, we need to change the standard statistical methods we use to analyze data so that it actually fits the assumptions of the methods. So anytime you're going to do standard statistical analysis in data that are uh, spatially autocorrelated, you need to think of this uh, spatial autocorrelation as a potential uh, violating, as potentially violating the assumptions in your analysis. Okay? Anyone copying? Mm -hmm. Writing? I can wait. By the way, I need water. Am I going too fast? No? Too slow? Okay? So before break, um, I want you to make a distinction between what we call the point pattern 
and the surface pattern spatial analysis. And it's a very important distinction, but it's also kind of easy to understand. The point pattern spatial analysis, which is a whole group of statistical analysis for spatially structured data, is interested in how events of or uh, how events are scattered in space. For example, suppose you are studying the distribution of a plant or, or a plant population in space. So the occurrence of each individual plant is the focus of my analysis. And I would like to understand if that kind of plant tend to occur close to uh, individuals of the same species. So if individuals tend to occur nearby, or if they tend to kind of repel each other so that they are usually far, far away, two individuals of the same species don't happen together. So notice that my question relates to how these individuals are distributed in space, right? I'm not really asking if there's some characteristic of each individual that makes it be located in that particular place. I'm just asking if they are close or far, right? And this is what we call point pattern spatial analysis. So I'm an analyzing the pattern of point, points in space, right? And if you're going to do that kind of analysis, there's a whole uh, set of assumptions we need to make, and our data set must be prepared for that in a given way. On the other hand, there is this one that we call the surface pattern spatial analysis, and, um, and this, one we, this is the one we're going to explore tonight, uh, today. And for, suppose you, we are studying the map of temperature uh, in South Africa. Temperature happens everywhere. It's not an event. It's, it's a phenomenon. So it doesn't matter where you go, you can measure temperature. So differently from the point pattern spatial analysis, the surface pattern spatial analysis is related to a continuous phenomenon in space, right? So you cannot study or you cannot ask yourself why temperature, uh, if, if temperature are far away in space, it doesn't make any sense. You can ask if temperature is similar in space, but the phenomenon is continuous. Right? So we have to make this very important distinction because that clearly affects the assumptions of our analysis. In the first, uh, first for point pattern spatial analysis, we are interested in discrete events in space. Right? You can go there, you can see the event, and you can georeference that event. For uh, uh, surface pattern spatial analysis, you could virtually be anywhere and still measure that event. You just happen to have set a grid that measured in this way or that way, but it doesn't really matter because I can just move one mil millimeter and still measure temperature. I can go anywhere and measure temperature. And that's because it's a surface in a continuous phenomenon. So for point pattern spatial analysis, we need complete surveys within a well-defined area. So because we are talking about a discrete event and the relationship of these events in space, we need to set a plot. For example, we are studying uh, a distribution of individuals of a population of plant. Then we set a plot that is 
10 meters by 10 meters. And within this plot, I have to georeference all events of occurrence of that particular plant. And I cannot miss not a single one. I, I, I need complete census, right? 